look like a bunch of pinballs, you know, just he said you, didn't, you weren't doing anything, but you could really run. <laughs> so, he said, he said y'all were in great physical condition. He said you just didn't know how to play football, you know. Uh, but one of the things I learned in that is that pain can actually be enjoyable. It actually can be to where you push yourself and you challenge yourself and you see gains and you see growth and development and actually even the hard things are fun. I mean, you actually want to run full force into something, you know, and you actually want to try to lift something that's too heavy and you want to, you know, uh, jump, you know, go running full speed and dive onto your chest and knock the wind out of yourself. And, you know, pain gets to be fun. It gets to be enjoyable. Now, I'm a long ways removed from those days, just in case you're wondering. But I'll just tell you something. Hardship has benefits. Enduring hardships is not a bad thing. It's not always. Hey, come on up and, and uh, find a comfortable seat if you like to. We're in Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Tasha, you have a church bulletin. Um, difficulties and hardships are not a bad thing for a believer. They develop us. They show us how we can grow, uh, and oftentimes they expose us to things in our life that didn't belong or shouldn't have been there. Uh, who knows how many, how many times hardships have averted disaster from uh, just being lackadaisical or ungrateful. Uh, okay, so Paul talked about the fact that the gospel was preached more with him in prison than it would have been with him out. And it was preached in places that it could not have made it to had he not been in prison. He said, it's great. The gospel's preached. And I don't care if people are preaching out of envy and strife or out of contention. If the gospel's preached and people come to Jesus Christ, then it's better for me to be in prison than it is for me not to. Uh, have you ever gone through suffering and by the grace of God endured it or are still enduring and realized that the patience and the experience that you learned, you wouldn't, you wouldn't pass on for anything? Um, I suppose this is a somewhat fitting illustration. They say when you lose a loved one, you're far more compassionate after when you've gone through when you've suffered a loss of a loved one. Now, it's frightening to me to think of ever losing my spouse. I can't. It's one of those things I can't really think about. I lost my sister last year. We were very close. We were a year and a half. What is it? Year and a, I guess this would be the second year. Yeah, over a year ago. Yeah, my sister died. We were very close. You know, we, you know, we spoke a couple times a week, but we were close growing up and all that. And uh, when somebody tells me something, like for instance, the, the girl's counselor at the Bill Rice Ranch this year, the, the girl that was there, she said, you know, that her dad got a rare form of blood cancer and died suddenly last year. Now, I've always been compassionate to that, but I feel it now when somebody says it. In other words, it, it hurts, it crushes. You get those, you have those, that pain, the emotion, the things that happen in you. When you think about it, it's just it's it's more personal to you in a way, and you can be much more thoughtful and caring for people. And I'll just be honest with you, that's a good thing. You don't want to go through a loss to learn something like that, but a loss helps you learn something like that, and it's a good thing. Uh, and you know, you look at it and you say, well, you know, if I had a choice between this event happening or not happening, you have to say, well, you know what? God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is good. And so Paul is emphasizing that. Now, in the beginning of our passage of Scripture today, Paul talks about as well how to think. And he goes on to say, while in prison, mind you, he says, finally, brethren, so he's beginning our conclusion of this study on how to think in suffering. So he said, it's better that I'm suffering. He said um, that we're to have the mind of Christ in suffering. If Jesus became a servant of men, so are we. But now he says, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, he said, for me, it's not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Now, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Where is Paul? In prison. In prison. And he's saying, be not just happy, be rejoicing. Literally, overjoyed. Fullness of joy. Rejoice in the Lord. And he begins to tell what he had in the flesh. He talks about his position as a Pharisee. He was circumcised the eighth day in verse 5. He's of the stock of Israel. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. 
He is in Hebrew of the Hebrews, and he was a, as touching law, he's a Pharisee. He said, What I had was a lot. Now, you may not be impressed by that, but a good Jewish uh, believer would say, Wow, Paul had quite a pedigree, had quite a reputation. Let's tell you something. Before Paul came to Jesus Christ, even when he persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, Paul himself, while doing that, um, did so with great zeal and had the respect of all his own countrymen. And now he is saying in verse eight, he said, or verse seven, but what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ. Now his statement, his command is rejoice evermore. In other words, be rejoicing always, or always rejoicing. And then he goes on to say, not only to, to rejoice, but he said, understand the source of your joy. Your source of your joy is not what you have attained, accomplished. The source of your joy isn't who you are or what you've done. Paul said, I had all these things, and if you think that's what makes me happy, if you think that's what motivates me to say in prison, persecuted for the cause of Jesus Christ, to rejoice, you're sadly mistaken. You misunderstand where joy comes from. He said, what gain, things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is not here doing the Christian brag thing. We were, <laughs> one of the preachers at camp last week, he was kind of funny. He talked about, you know, the pre conversion He talked about how his dad was a drunk. His dad's dad was a drunk. And uh, his, his grandfather, his dad, and then he, his father uh, was a drunk by the age of 22. He was a terrible drunk. And he got saved. He talked about how people use the term gloriously saved. You know, as though someone who isn't a drunk isn't gloriously saved. He talked about how, you know, say they say so this person saved from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet and so forth. And he was kind of making fun of it. He talked about his life, you know. He talked about how, you know, he'd been uh, I I, don't know, I couldn't I couldn't go through his whole spiel about what he was by the time he was saved at the age of four. But it was kind of funny. And uh, anyway, but he talked about how his dad went to unshackled and shared his testimony. He said, you know, the greatest thing in my life is that you never have to live my life. You'll never have to go through what I've gone through. And sometimes people do kind of rejoice in, uh, if you will, or brag about what they're saved from or how bad they were uh, when they came to Jesus Christ. And Paul isn't saying, he isn't bragging here. He's not saying about what he was before. But sometimes people also brag about what they gave up for Jesus. I remember uh, being told a story by a pastor friend about somebody in his church who got saved and who was a you know a multimillionaire. And after he got saved, it seemed like just he just lost everything. And then shortly thereafter, he died of cancer. And uh, he used to come on, on soul winning and it always impressed everybody around him, but he wasn't really impressed by it. Uh, he was dying of cancer. But a week or two before he died of cancer, he came out on church visitation. And he said... And he said something kind of sarcastic. He said, I just feel bad for the poor folks that can't make it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's a couple ways, oh, a day is away from dying, and everybody else has got their excuses for why they can't go and tell lost people about Jesus. And he's just saying, well, you know, I just feel bad for the poor folks. You know, they can't make it, because obviously he could. And But people tell a story about everything he lost. So he had millions, and he lost millions, and he lost this, and he lost that. Well, was that because he came to Jesus? Well, maybe if he was, if if what he was doing was dishonest before, Dr. Shermerhorn told me about a man that used to he owned strip clubs before he was born again. He got saved, and and uh, they he he actually was worth a lot of money. But what do you do with that? You gonna sell it? No, he closed it down. He shut it down. He stopped it from ever being able to come up again. Changed city ordinances in the area so that they wouldn't be approved again in that area. And he was penniless by the time he was done getting rid of the filth that he propagated beforehand. But he didn't give up anything for Jesus. And Paul here is saying, listen, this is what I was in the flesh. This is what I was born being. But I want you to know something. What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. And he's not saying I lost everything for following Jesus. No, he goes on to say in verse 9, he's, or verse 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, he's not saying I lost everything for Jesus. He's saying those things are lost. And the word there is the word like we would use for loser. In other words, he said, I consider those things to be lost. 
And the idea is, is the rather or instead of Jesus Christ my Lord. In other words, if he had those things and he did not have Jesus, he'd be lost. And he'd be a loser for it. My friend, without Jesus Christ, without Christ as your Savior, what do you have? So many times individuals uh, look to the things of the third things of this world to satisfy them, and then they're a loss. But the reminder here in Philippians is that for believers to look at life and to have an expectation of ease, an expectation of comfort, an expectation of easy satisfaction, Paul is trying to help them to understand I'd never have Jesus and I'd be a loser. In other words, that isn't what life's about and it wouldn't satisfy me. How many of you know somebody who's gotten something that they thought would make them happy? What do they find out when they got it? Doesn't. Can't. I remember, I remember my first Nintendo. My only Nintendo. <laughs> the original Nintendo. Back in the 19... Back in the 1980s. Right? <laughs> Uh, my friend had a Nintendo and I used to go to his house every day and we played Nintendo it was a lot of fun matter of fact I, that's all I wanted to do I'd get out of school and he'd get out of school and I'd go to his house and he'd be like what do you want to do i say oh can we play Nintendo yeah let's play Nintendo and we do it every day and uh, we didn't have a TV in our house and so I started making it known to my parents that Nintendo was pretty cool and uh, they used to have uh, how many of you remember the tennis game? The little round knobs <laughs> and the ball that goes boink, boink, and the little flat thing that slides oh, yeah, back yeah. up. Some of y'all do. My parents had that before I was born. What's that? That's before your time out? <laughs> what is that, like the 1920s? <laughs> My goodness. They had that before 1950. That's what you're telling me? The tennis game? No, come on. Come on now. It's in the Smithsonian, I think. I'm pretty sure it is in this. I'm not kidding. It is in the American history in the Smithsonian. That game is, and I think it's from the 1970s. So you were well developed by that time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I. He was a deprived child. I didn't even look at him, did I? Until right now, right? I did not start this. It just. You had to insert. You missed me, didn't you, brother? That's what it is. That's right. <laughs> okay. So there, there is one of those in the Smithsonian, no kidding. And I remember being a kid and wishing I could play it when I went to the Smithsonian because I thought it was fun. So that would have been back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. But anyway, but I remember one in Nintendo. And it was probably, the Atari came out, what, in the late 70s, early 80s? But the Nintendo was the first really legit gaming system. I mean, seriously. <laughs> oh, wait, was that before your time too, Al, the Atari? When, when did Atari come out? You know? You don't know. What? All right. Thank you. I should have asked Joel. I knew Joel would know. Okay. Thank you, guys. So it was out. But the, the original Nintendo was like what I wanted. And I remember making it known to my parents and just thinking, I'm never going to get one of those. We didn't even have a TV in our house, and they don't want a TV. Because my dad took our TV when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I used to be out walking in the woods, and I'd see out in the middle of the woods a color television, which was a thing to be color, you know, back then, out in the middle of the woods. And he'd gotten convicted about it sometime when I was either just an infant or around that time. And uh, he realized that the time he was wasting and the, and the trash they were putting on the television coming into the home, he said, I wouldn't let people talk around me like that. And that they're doing it in the house. So he took the TV and threw it out in the woods. When I, I was, so it always is in the woods when I was a kid, and so here I am, I'm a teenager, almost a teenager, maybe I'm 11 or 12, almost 13, somewhere in that area, and I'm thinking, man, I'd love to have a Nintendo, it's never going to happen. But I told my parents about it, I told them I wanted a Nintendo, and <coughs> never going to happen, you know, that's, that's how my parents responded, yeah, you know, you're never going to get one of those, we wouldn't have that thing in our house. Well, my dad was the guy in town that if you needed money and you had something to sell, he was the guy you went to. He's always buying something from somebody. People. He had. A, he had a. At that time, he had a radiator shop, and he's always coming home with something. You know. One day, my dad came home with a Nintendo. No kidding. This college kid had bought a Nintendo, and he needed money, and he went to my dad, and and my dad had in the back of his mind he knew what a Nintendo was because 
his boys, my brother and I, were talking about Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. We'd like to have one. And my dad got one. And he went and got a black and white TV from somewhere, and we hooked it up. Our first Nintendo was in black and white. And uh, he came home, got me and my brother, and we went to Blockbuster Video. <laughs> and we rented video games, like five of them. And one in particular, the Commandos, is a helicopter game where you fly a helicopter like this and it'll shoot something, I don't remember what. And my dad and my brother and I fought over, you know, who was next, and we played Nintendo the whole night. And I'll just tell you something, I thought when I got that Nintendo, if I had one, all I'd do is want to play it. I got bored with my Nintendo in a week. Can you believe that? I beat Super Mario Brothers, learned all the tricks, you know, all the ways to beat the game, how to get unlimited lives, how to, you know, all the things that you, you know that are hidden in the games. You know, I didn't get to where the guys that can play it with their eyes closed, you know, and I didn't play it that much. But I got bored with it in just a couple of weeks. And I'll just be honest with you, I haven't had a recent desire to play Nintendo. I've had some nostalgic throwback things. They're selling like a miniature one now, so it will be kind of cool to have. My brother still has ours. But it didn't satisfy me. I mean, honestly, I'm telling you as a kid, I thought if I just got a Nintendo, I'd never want anything else. I wouldn't want to eat, sleep, breathe, nothing. I would just want to play Nintendo all the time. And I was about that extreme about it, and I got over it in a week's time. And when I'd wake up in the morning, it just didn't bring me joy or satisfaction. And you know, you say that's childish. Well, I was a child. Of course it was. But you know... We're like that about things. We can be like that about things, can't we, even today? We can just want something so badly, and we just think, man, if I just had that. Uh, and we don't realize that those things don't satisfy, and that the source of our joy is Jesus Christ. So when Paul makes a statement from prison and says, finally, brethren, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, he is in the statements pointing out the source of joy. Don't miss this because it's so understated. I cannot count the times in my life when I have had joy in Jesus Christ my Lord. You could bring a brand new Nintendo in here today and give it to me and I'd say that's neat. I'd be happy to have it, but I probably wouldn't take it out of the box. My friend, I've had fresh joy in Jesus Christ this week, this morning. I've had fresh joy in Jesus Christ countless times in my life, and I will do so while I remain on this earth. In other words, I have something that I could literally be in the position of Paul in the prison. And I could be in bonds and I could be in chains and yet I could be completely rejoicing because of who Jesus Christ is. Paul said, I was this and this and this and this. And I'll tell you something, Paul is evidently one of the guys that needs to have power, respect. He's one of those guys that needs to be in front. You know people that, that are like that? I mean, what fulfills them in life is being somebody, sort of like a politician. I mean, he just needed accolades. He needed people to look at him and say, look at Paul. What a zealous guy. What a courageous man. What an educated, intelligent man he is. And Paul needed that. And that was his gain. It wasn't money. It was what he built. It was that reputation he built around himself of, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he said, loss. And now he's sitting in prison saying to people who are concerned both for His welfare and for their own future, He's saying, Rejoice in the Lord. What well, things were gained to me, I count loss for Jesus Christ. He said, hey, yea, doubtless, in verse... Uh, verse uh, oh man. That's, that's verse 8. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb. Now friend, that isn't polite, is it? Literally, he compares the very height of his glory and achievement 
to excrement, which doesn't have monetary value in a normal economy. In verse 9 he says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And then he gives the purpose statement. When you see the word that in the Scripture, that I may know him. Friend, do you know Him? Do you know Jesus? It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? To have Christ in us, God's Spirit living in us, speaking to us, and literally knowing that God of the universe, who created the world, who is in control of all things, who has guaranteed my eternal destiny, I know Him and the power of His resurrection. And while Paul is in such a seemingless powerless, seemingly powerless... I mean, does anything look less powerful than being in prison? I mean, if you're fighting the good fight of faith, dying doesn't look so powerless, does it? But getting in prison? I mean, it's one thing, isn't it? To, to uh, hit say, a terrorist with a drone with a, with a missile strike. It's a whole other thing to capture him alive, isn't it? And Paul said, he's in prison. He said, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection being made attainable unto His death. In other words, he said, it's all worthwhile to suffer for Jesus Christ just so I can know Him. And it's so worth it. So worth it. Have you ever known somebody that God had greatly used felt like it was a privilege to know him. You ever met somebody kind of important? You ever met somebody that's, you know, on TV. You only see them on TV and here you are seeing them. You're seeing them in person and they're just a regular person and they know your name and they're actually interested in your life and you're having a conversation. You're kind of feeling like, well, that's pretty cool. I know him. I know this person. This is the person everybody wishes they could know and I've actually met them in person and they know me and it's, it's pretty neat and you kind of want to hang out with them. And they say, you want to go to lunch? Yeah, I want to go to lunch. Because I'm hungry, not because I like you. <laughs> you know, and, and you, 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 it's amazing. We're talking about God of the universe knowing Him. God knows how to make, make the world. He made the world. God loves you so much, He sent Jesus as your Savior. He's a loving person. He can meet all your needs. And you can know Him. And that's a cause, that's a reason for rejoicing. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, now, this is a word that has to do with getting a hold of everything, getting a hold of the life of Christ, or it is a word of accomplishment. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, Christian, I want to tell you something. You never go anywhere looking back. You never go anywhere looking backward. I love you know, the, when Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. And I know exactly what it means. I'm embarrassed to say, uh, let's see what this would be. That's five, maybe six years, maybe seven, eight years ago now. That was the last time I was on a tractor um, working on the farm. My dad had cancer and he had a surgery. And so I, I went home to be with him. And Melissa's granddad had cancer too. He was, she was in Arkansas. I dropped her off. I went to be with my dad. And my dad needed to spray his fields. with, uh, And so... He wasn't physically able to do it, and so I said, "Well, I'll do it." So I hooked up the tractor and put uh, put the you know got the sprayer all together and all that. And they have on the sprayer they have these little soap things that drip soap blobs so that you can see where you've been because you don't have a disc or a plow line. <laughs> and uh, it's been a long time since I've been on a tractor. It's been a long time since I've done any farm work. I used to be able. To, my grandpa taught me. He said, "You look at a tree, you know." I don't know, a quarter mile, half a mile away, you look at a spot, maybe it's in the middle of the field, you look at a rock, and he said, you just go to that spot, and he said, you don't look back. He said, if you turn around, you'll get off. And he said, if you get off, he said, everybody will see it. You're planting, you know, you got your planter behind your drill, and you get off, and I mean, you can see it, you know, there's, there's these wiggly lines in the middle, and there's no greater shame for anyone who's a farmer than to have someone else who's a farmer go by your field and see where you have, you know, wiggly tail lines because you can't keep things straight. And I was spraying and I tried to, to just double cover some areas because I knew 
you know, I'm just, I get looking, I'm just, you know, I see a deer, oh, look at that deer, you know, I see a turkey, oh, look at the turkey. You know, I'd get bored and looking around and couldn't stay focused. And I saw that field that I sprayed uh, the, that later on that year, and there were spots of weeds, clumps of weeds everywhere, you know, and uh, it's kind of embarrassing to me. And <laughs> the thing is, is that looking back is what caused it. Looking around, looking behind me, looking at the spray. Oh, I wonder if I still got. I wonder if I still have, um, you know, spray in the sprayer. You know, I wonder if I still have the chemicals in there. And checking those things. And there's no kind of way to live. There's no kind of way to work. And for you, believer, looking back oftentimes is regrets. It is wondering if, when I made a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ, now that I'm suffering, I wonder if I made the right decision. I wonder if it was worth it. If I'd done this instead, maybe I wouldn't have suffered loss. And if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, don't look back. Don't look at loss. Look at gain. He said all things that he said that I count a loss. He said I count them by dung. But his gain is in verse 14. He said I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said God's called me to something better. It's a high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Now, friend, I just want to tell you something. You could die with a million dollars and you probably wouldn't impress the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? There's the old adage about you never see a U-Haul behind a hearse until a couple people thought it was funny and had a U-Haul behind their hearse. But the reality of it is you can't take anything to their grave. You can't take anything with you. You could bury in money and your body would rot just the same. The reality of it is, is that if you and I live for anything other than the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, we settle for something which is loss. And the word loss there is the word loser. Now you say, Pastor, it's not nice. I know, but my wife isn't in here right now. And so that we can use that word. And that's what Paul's saying. He said, if I had those things, I'd be a loser. What I have instead is a high calling. And he said, I'm going for that. You know where Paul is today? You know where he's at? He's in heaven. He's with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he counted that his life, which would have been gone a couple of thousand years ago, would have been forfeit and expired a couple of thousand years ago, he counted that that brief existence that he had was not worth anything, but that eternity was worth everything. And he lived for Jesus Christ. And brethren, I wonder if you have ever come to a place and a time and a decision when you've determined the same. Sometimes the dreams and the expectations of life <laughs> don't get realized. When they are realized, oftentimes we come to the understanding that they weren't what we thought they were. And then sometimes we don't realize them at all. And we live in disappointment. But one of the things that we learn very quickly is the brevity of our existence. We do not know whether we have a tomorrow. We certainly don't know how many tomorrows we do have, if we do. And what we know is that we need to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to press toward the mark. Is that what you're doing? Is that how you're living? And that's the challenge on how to respond in suffering. Friend, when you're suffering, don't look back, don't look down. Look up to Jesus. Look ahead for that high mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to say like Paul, I rejoice, I count those things that physically or in earthly speaking would be gain. I count those a loss and I'm pressing for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus. Help us to comprehend and to live it in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We'll be back in about 12 minutes for Sunday School.